Hello and welcome back to Ecocentric. In this video I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the second large uh, perennial that I have decided to uh, try and grow here in Newfoundland. This is the hardy kiwi. Most of you are probably familiar with the fuzzy kiwi that you'll get in the uh, grocery stores. The hardy kiwi, however, is quite a bit smaller, as you can see by this picture. Here's a size comparison. And another size comparison. They are also known as cocktail kiwi. Here, they're called nigiri. Nigiris or Nigiri fruits. The other name is uh, kiwi berries. See, I love kiwis, um, but these, the fuzzy ones, they're already some you can get already to zone five, but for the most part, zones eight and nine, and you can grow them down to zone seven. Now the variated uh, hardy kiwi you may have seen, that is the arctic kiwi, but this version has entirely green uh, foliage, and since I'm growing them from seed, then you'll have a wide variety of uh, fruit shapes and sizes, so I won't know exactly what I'm getting until I got them. But they're hardy down to zone 4 and some varieties down as low as zone 3 they'll start fruiting according to this site at about five to nine years so that's a wide uh, margin there the arctic kiwi they say uh, can start fruiting in as little as three years so we shall see what will happen with these So as I was reading through the different scientific articles on this species, then it said it was native to the uh, Manchuria area of uh, China, which is actually this area here. Now what they've done uh, for this graphic, they're doing a study on them. So this is the study areas. But as you can see, they are here in the southern end of Russia, in the Manchuria area, down into the Korean Peninsula, in northern Japan, and southern Japan. <clears throat> in this area here, they grow right down to sea level. But as you go further south, you see how the actual uh, Arguda species, they drift inland and there is a mountain here as well. Their lower limit increases the further south you go till you get down here and uh, they don't grow below 3500 feet I believe it was. So they need cool summers. So here's our bin in China. If we zoom out you see North Korea is down below here. If we go back over to the other map, that will be, let me get something bigger to point out. That will be here. Right in the center of uh, Manchuria in China. So I pulled up the average temperatures in her bin yeah. and this is the only data that I have. This is last year's data. 
So this is in Celsius, and maximum and mean. And this is the mean uh, Celsius temperatures in our bin. I get minus seven. Uh, it's really about minus twelve, I think. Uh, the mean on a normal year. There's eight minus eighteen in uh, Manchuria. Uh, minus 5 for February, they get minus 14 and so on. When you get into July and August, June, July and August, see I have 16, 18 and 20 and they have 20, 23 and 21. So a little bit warmer. However, These are the areas, the little yellow dots, where this species have been spotted growing wild. This is about uh, invasive plants worldwide. Locations where the species have been sighted and confirmed worldwide. This plant is native to Northeastern Asia and China, yet is being found in Central Europe and the Eastern United States and into Northern Canada. There's also this paper. Uh, it's the influence of climatic conditions of Northeastern Pola on the growth of Bauer, which is the variety that I am growing. We can scroll down in this paper. They have the mean daily temperatures in the experimental years and the multi-annual mean. So look down this multi-annual mean and you'll see uh, June is 17.7, 18, July 18, August 18, September 12. Going back to my data, June is 16, July is 18, August is 20. September is 15. So I am getting the same temperature range as their study in Poland. And this is their spring ground frost, which goes up into May on 2000. See, May the 14th here, May the 13th, and the last of May in 2007. So their last frost is only about a week before ours. And the last thing I wanted to mention about the climate of where they grow. This is our bin again. The humidity, as you can see, stays fairly stable throughout the year. And it's a high humidity. It's basically the same as we get here. The average rainfall... It's very low in uh, the winter months and peaks in the summer months. Ours is pretty much even throughout. We will probably have a little drier here, maybe down to say 100 millimeters or something. Uh, but the winters are wetter. See, this is an interest I have with these as well. Ontario is doing a specialty crop opportunities and they put it in with such things as the sea berry, um, amaranth, I don't know what this other thing is here, and they're calling it northern kiwi. Other common names include hardy kiwi, Chinese gooseberry, and arguta. These things can grow fast and long. They can reach heights normally over 35 feet, 10 meters. In the development and commercialization of baby kiwi by M.H. Williams and et al. They actually said that this species is a vigorous deciduous climber that can grow up into the forest canopy draping trees sometimes more than 25 meters 
high. So 25 meters, um, every 3 meters is 10 feet. So you're talking 80, over 80 feet. This is why I was interested in getting the uh, thorny version of the honey locust because I thought I can grow kiwi up the honey locust and have the two uh, fruits together. Then as we move down further down the paper, <coughs> the mean fruit weight, 10 to 12 grams, mean fruit number per vine was 5,000 fruit, the mean yield per vine, 50 kilograms, and the yield per canopy, that's uh, acres, was 30 tons. So given the right uh, conditions, <laughs> these things can produce. The version that they were doing, see young vines are uh, precocious, beginning to bear in their second year, and are expected to reach full capacity at six to seven years. But with respect to their size and how fast they grow, the benefit there is that you can plant them in poor soil to restrict their growth. And you'd still get a plant and fruit in poor soil. To grow them commercially, you grow them similar to grapes. What you have here is a tea, and then a ways down, you'll have another tea, and of course a ways out here, and there'll be a wire, or you can put the wood, one at, at the outer ends of the cross member, and one going down the center. And you plant a plant beside each post, and then they go out and the vine comes this way and goes that way and the side shoots hang out over the outer wires. This one is more like the uh, regular grape where you just put a post and the one vine going across and they'll just have vines hanging down. These, that's the one where you do similar to um, like the cucumber trellises that people put up. So you have one trellis going this way, one trellis going that way. You have a plant planted every so far. And from its base, you train it into a V. It'd have two main trunks. And of course the side shoots would just hang around the um, trellises. You can see they're not very high. Now this is probably a deer fence, so say 10 feet high. And then here's your plants down here, so they're really low. And you walk along and you hand pick them. There's no special equipment for picking those. They are a little delicate, so if you were to use mechanical equipment, you'd just crush them. So being that they are native to an area that has, it's a tad bit warmer than here, but not much. Um, they grow in cool summer areas. They have similar rainfall and humidity. I'm thinking that they will probably grow well for me on my property. In the windier areas of Newfoundland, you would probably need a protection. So if you can build or grow a protected area, I'm expecting them to do well. I'm going to leave you now with a slideshow of different uh, pictures of the kiwi fruits themselves. And you'll see they, if they pr produce as even 
half good, it will be a very good fruit for here in Newfoundland.